Every now and then, an outsider comes along and questions the accepted way of doing things. Marine physicist Nan Bray is doing just that on her superfine wool property in Tasmania. The way she runs her 1600 sacks and merinos may seem radical, but she says it works, as wool production and quality is up and her costs are down. The Nan Bray way combines old-fashioned shepherding skills, groundbreaking research from the US and the knowledge and wisdom of an 87-year-old wool industry legend. When it comes to being taken seriously as a farmer, Nan Bray jokes that she's got a few strikes against her. She's American, a woman and a city slicker. And to further cement her outsider status, her merinos have tails. It's taken a while, but the shearers are now used to her unusual methods. She's proved me wrong every time. I didn't think she'd be able to grow super fine wool here, and she's done that, so um, I don't doubt her anymore. I, uh, I'll just go along. If she says she's going to do something, I believe it. So. <laughs> Recently, a book profiling eight women successfully running their own farms featured Nan. So word spreading about her unorthodox methods. Uh, and a lot of my colleagues in CSIRO looked at me and said, you're doing what? <laughs> Nan grew up in the city, but never forgot the tales she heard as a child about her grandpa, who was a cattle rancher. I didn't know my grandfather. He died before I was born. So I grew up with those stories. So, And I wanted to farm, but um, I was pretty much um, told unequivocally that I would have a profession, I would go to university, and farming was not a way of making a living. So she became a marine physicist. The job took her around the world. But 13 years ago, while heading up CSIRO's marine division in Hobart, she bought Lemon Hill at Oatlands in central Tasmania and became a wool grower. She had no experience with sheep or wool, just shopping. I came across these wonderful suits made out of Australian wool, um, very expensive, St. John knits, and, but they were beautiful and they were lovely to wear. And I basically lived in those for six years as a chief of division and traveled in them, you know, slept on airplanes in them and they always looked good. So I thought, hmm, hmm. And they were really expensive, so in my little tiny brain I thought, well, there must be a profit in this somewhere, you know. <laughs> When you found this place, was mm -hmm. it clapped out? Did it need oh. help? <laughs> yes, in a word. Um, it's, uh, I think maybe there's only one um, rundown farm in anybody's life, you know, that you can, that you have the energy and the heart to, to do what you need to do. So, I mean, for the first two years, probably every weekend, I took a trailer load of rubbish to the tip. Nan needed advice and local Davy Carnes agreed to help. So, Mr Dave, um, you'll do the gates for me? Yeah. The 87-year-old started in the wool industry when he was 13 and, like his father, has worked for many of Tasmania's best wool growers. I said to uh, Nan, you're sorry, you know, she gave her job up. I said, you're sorry, you a good job there, a lucrative job. I said, on the land, it won't be half as lucrative as what it is now. And she gave me a she said, Mr. Dave, with your knowledge and my size, we'll make this work. <laughs> when you first came and worked with her, what did you think about her ideas? Well, uh, she had no ideas of the land. She just left it entirely to me. But a few years into the renovation of Lemon Hill, the first of Nan's new ideas emerged, prompted by her recall of a book by ecologist Aldo Leopold she'd read as a student. It hadn't meant much to her then, but 30 years later it did. He was really thinking about actively trying to work through what, what would it mean for farmers to have a production system that worked with the ecosystem that underlies it. 
Um, so yeah, so when I found the book again, um, years and years later, I was like, it's like coming home. It's just great. Nan started managing her land differently. And then a sick sheep called Alice turned her approach to farming on its head. Unable to stand, Alice was in a sling. Nan became her grazing assistant and would take her out to a paddock near the house to feed. Fortuitously, it had a lot of weeds. I started watching and she was eating in the same order. So there was chicory, uh, plantain, which is another exotic um, plant that's, that works for um, intestinal parasites, um, lucerne, clover, and a couple kinds of grass. Chicory, plantain, lucerne, clover, get to the grass, she'd look up at me, can we move now? And then it dawned on me that she was very specific about which plant. I thought, oh, okay. So, I, I mean, I, I basically just watched that and went, well, there's something here. I don't know what it is. Nan realised Alice's eating pattern tied in with groundbreaking work done in the US by Professor Fred Provenza about the link between plant and animal behaviour. The animals are trying to balance their diets and the plants are trying to not be eaten to death. And so what the plants have developed in their ecological system is a whole set of uh, a range of defenses, most of which are chemical. Some of them are mechanical, like spines and things, but mostly they're chemical compounds that the plant manufactures that when an animal eats too much of it, it makes them nauseous. So then they stop eating that plant and move to another plant so that the plant that was being grazed goes, oh, phew, thank you. And um, gets a chance to regenerate. I learned from Alice that sheep are incredibly specific about what they eat. They know what they want to eat. Um, that a diversity is really important to them. That grass is the, uh, the last choice in the forage list. I always just sort of thought sheep ate grass, you know, what do you think? And then from Fred's research, what I learned was why. You know, why are those um, broadleaf plants so important in, for, the, for, for sheep nutrition, livestock nutrition generally. And, um, and then that allowed me to start changing some other things. Nan stopped fighting weeds. Alice taught her they're a medicine chest that sheep will use when they need. What Fred Provenza calls nutritional wisdom. You've just brought the mob through into this sort of laneway area mm -hmm. and they've immediately put their heads down and they're absolutely going for it. What are they eating? I reckon that they're eating a bit of chicory. Um, this is chicory. It's um, an exotic plant and it has properties that help the sheep deal with worm burden and uh, they love it. We have not rented sheep for years and years. When they look as if they're not right, they, they tell you more or less, once you know them. We put them in what we call the chicory patches. They eat the chicory and they get right. No worm. And that's a big expense. This dam paddock is the farm's pharmacy. But how do the sheep know what to eat and when? Well, Nan says farmers have to help them learn. Now there's no forced weaning. Nan lets the lambs wean themselves and then stay with their mothers, who then teach their young what to eat. They mean bring the rams in first. We've got to bring the rams in first. Yeah. And, Davey said um, the pair have had a few arguments as new management practices, which challenge so everything yeah. he's seen and done, are introduced. But he's days, now a convert. She's got some very radical ideas, I might say, but they are all, to me, they're sensible ideas. They can work. Nan's sheep aren't divided into age groups. They live in multi-generational flocks. Again, not what Davy was used to. I like it. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I just like it. Why? I think the animals themselves get more contented. They are more contented doing that sort of thing. Yeah. Do you yeah. think that a mother and, a, and its baby, even two, two years after she might have had that lamb, did they know each other? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. My weather do. Oh, yes. They know their family groups. My gee, they do. 
Oh, yes. Yeah. Nan says allowing a family social structure to exist has transformed flock behaviour. She's seen a family group surround and protect a sick ewe from crows. It's like there's this strength of the social fabric that supports all of the animals in the flock. They don't run away. Um, you go into a paddock, even um, with strangers about. The sheep may move away, but they invariably will turn and look at you and go, well, <clears throat> would you like to state your business because you're on our territory? So it's not the kind of stuff you're used to associating with sheep. But perhaps the biggest change at Lemon Hill was Nan's decision to keep the tails on her sheep. She says it's an animal welfare issue. She says lambs with tails grow faster and weigh more. And because of their varied diet, don't get daggy and at risk of fly strike. The shearers were shocked to see tails, but Nan pays them more. It's very different. Uh, I don't think there'd be no shearer would actually say they enjoy doing it. Uh, shearing them's actually not too bad. It's probably the crutching is the, the problem. Uh, I think Nan's uh, got a fairly stringent crutching routine where she does it a lot more regularly than perhaps you would with normal sheep, uh, which makes it probably a lot better. It's a little tricky when you get the end of the tail because, uh, you know, up to, up to a point you can hold the end of the tail, it makes a nice handle. But then you get to the end of the tail and you've got to do something. And, and in fact, we've kind of agreed that it's okay if they just leave a little sort of poodle pom-pom on the end. <laughs> Took me a little bit to get used to that one. They did, really. But uh, one day we had a, an agent here, John Denham. He remarked on how heavy those lambs were that had their tails on compared to the others. So that convinced me that leave their tails on there. The changes here might sound all very nice, but do they make good business sense? Nan says yes, as wool production is up 40%, fertility and lambing percentages by nearly 30%, and wool quality has improved. The wool is better if the sheep are contented. I've seen that repeatedly in my lifetime. And here, they have been very, very contented, yes. Can wool producers learn from what's being done here? Yes, straight away, no, yes, they can. She's not a crazy American. No. <laughs> well, I'm a crazy Australian. I've worked in the industry all my life. In result is a wool. That's what, that's what I'm here for, to see that we can grow, and if we can grow good wool. OK, here you go. Cheers. No matter what Come the shearers on. or scientists she's based her methods on say, Nan knows some locals say she's crazy and Davy's gone senile. Mostly, you know, there's this lovely Australian thing of, mmm. So it's not, you know, your, to your face anyway, it's not your mad as a cut snake. It's, uh, hmm, that's interesting. This year's clip is where the evidence is. This is probably some of the best wool in the world, to be honest with you. This is, uh, it's quite incredible. Normally this super fine wool's got to be running in uh, more bush sort of country. So once again, it's quite incredible. She's uh, been able to get this sort of micron with uh, running sheep in a paddock in Oatlands and uh, not half starving them like they do normally. So to get them this fine, it's quite incredible. To me, it is very, very, very good. At 17, like on, it's uh, as good as I've seen for a long time. And you don't know until the first fleece hits the table or the first few fleeces hit the table, you just don't know. Oh yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good clip this year. Was, and it was a tough season. It's been a really pretty hard year. So it was nice to, uh, for there not to be a lot of tender wool, there's hardly any, so it was, that was unusual and nice long length and colour's good and so yeah, very happy with it. All right guys, this is the end of two years of waiting, so. Yeah, yeah. And just as people were getting used to Nan Bray wool grower, she surprised them by becoming Nan Bray wool retailer. Right. When Lemon Hill's 17 Perfect. micron wool was delivered back to her as hand knitting yarn, her new local mates helped celebrate. Oh, wow! 
So this is this is maybe a world first. Yep, that's you understand, there is no, as far as I know, there is no 17 micron knitting, hand to knitting yarn made. How do you feel about it, Mr. Day? Oh, it's lovely, lovely. The sheep yep. faces, that's Alice herself. <laughs> Some of Alice's wool is in this, I'm sure of it. She's already sold a third of her yarn and has just sent two tons of fleece to New Zealand for another run. When I started farming, I, I can still remember thinking, oh, you know, watching sheep graze, how hard could that be? <laughs> so that, you know, 13 years later, I think I kind of know how to grow sheep. And I have to say that the processing end of it is at least as, there's at least as much depth to learn in that as there was in the farming side itself. Cheers. Thank you. Nan Bray's glad she ignored her parents' advice not to go farming. Good work. She's not missing the corporate world and has no regrets. But she says she couldn't have done it without Alice or Davy. He's the one that taught me that sheep are not just little wool growing machines that eat grass. I don't think I would have as much, it, or it would have taken me longer to have the connection that I have both with the animals and with the property if it hadn't been for Davy and his example. We're good mates, real good friends. Oh yes, definitely so. <laughs> uh, yeah.